Jessica shook tears from the corners of her eyes. It was an angry gesture. You make me feel like a little girl again, reciting my first lesson. She forced the words out. Humans must never submit to animals. A dry sob shook her. In a low voice, she said, I've been so lonely. I should be one of the tests, the old woman said. Humans are almost always lonely. Now summon the boy. He's had a long, frightening day, but he's had time to think and remember, and I must ask the other questions about these dreams of his. Jessica nodded, went to the door of the meditation chamber, opened it. Paul, come in now, please. Paul and Moore emerged with a stubborn slowness. He stared at his mother as though she were a stranger. Weariness veiled his eyes when he glanced at the Reverend Mother, but this time he nodded to her. The nod one gives an equal. He heard his mother close the door behind him. Young man, the old woman said, let's return to this dream business. What do you want? Do you dream every night? Not dreams worth remembering. We can remember every dream, but some are worth remembering and some aren't. How do you know the difference? I just know it. The old woman glanced at Jessica, back to Paul. What did you dream last night? Was it worth remembering? Yes, Paul closed his eyes. I dreamed a cavern and water and a girl there. Very skinny with big eyes. Her eyes are all blue, no whites in them. I talk to her and tell her about you about seeing the Reverend Mother on Caladan. Paul opened his eyes. And the thing you tell this strange girl about seeing me, did it happen today? Paul thought about this, then. Yes, I tell the girl you came, put a stamp of strangeness on me. A stamp of strangeness, the old woman breathed. And again, she shot a glance at Jessica, returned her attention to Paul. Tell me truly now, Paul. Do you often have dreams of things that happen afterward exactly as you dreamed them? Yes, and I've dreamed about that girl before. Oh, you know her? I will know her. Tell me about her. Again, Paul closed his eyes. We're in a little place in some rocks where it's sheltered. It's almost night, but it's hot and I can see patches of sand out of an opening in the rocks. We're waiting for something, for me to go meet some people. And she's frightened, but trying to hide it from me. And I'm excited. And she says, tell me about the waters of your home world, Usal. Paul opened his eyes. Isn't that strange? My home world's Caladan never even heard of a planet called Uso. Is there more to this dream? Jessica prompted. Yes, but maybe she was calling me Uso, Paul said. I just thought of that. Again, he closed his eyes. She asks me to tell her about the waters, and I take her hand, and I say I'll tell her a poem, and I tell her the poem. But I have to explain some of the words, like beach and surf and seaweed and seagulls. What poem? The Reverend Mother asked. Paul opened his eyes. It's just one of Gurney Halleck's tone poems for sad times. Behind Paul, Jessica began to recite. I remember salt smoke from a beach fire and shadows under the pines, solid, clean, fixed. Seagulls perched at the tip of land, white upon green, and a wind comes through the pines to sway the shadows. The seagulls spread their wings, lift, and fill the sky with screeches, and I hear the wind blowing across our beach and the surf, and I see that our fire has scorched the seaweed. That's the one, Paul said. 
the old woman stared at Paul, then the young man, was a proctor of the Bene Gesserit. I see the Kwisat Haderach, the male who truly can become one of us. Your mother sees this possibility in you, but she sees with the eyes of a mother. Possibility I see, too, but no more. She fell silent and Paul saw that she wanted him to speak. He waited her out. Presently, she said, as you will then, you have depths in you that I'll grant. May I go now? He asked. Don't you want to hear what the Reverend Mother can tell you about the Kwisatz Hederach? Jessica asked. She said those who tried for it died. But I can help you with a few hints at why they failed, the Reverend Mother said. She talks of hints, Paul thought. She doesn't really know anything. And he said, hint then. And be damned to me, she smiled wryly. Crisscross of wrinkles in the old face. Very well. That which submits rules. He felt astonishment. She was talking about such elementary things, this tension within meaning. Did she think his mother had taught him nothing at all? That's a hint, he asked. We're not here to bandy words or quibble over their meaning, the old woman said. The willow submits to the wind and prospers until one day it has many willows. A wall against the wind. This is the willow's purpose. Paul stared at her. She said purpose, and he felt the word buffet him, reinfecting him with terrible purpose. He experienced a sudden anger at her, fatuous old witch with her mouth full of platitudes. You think I could be this Kwisatz? Haderach, he said. You talk about me, but you haven't said one thing about what we can do to help my father. I've heard you talking to my mother. You talk as though my father were dead. Well, he isn't. If there were a thing to be done for him, we'd have done it, the old woman growled. We may be able to salvage you. Doubtful, but possible. But for your father, nothing. When you've learned to accept that as a fact, you've learned a real Benny Gesserit lesson. Paul saw how the words shook his mother. He glared at the old woman. How could she say such a thing about his father? What made her so sure? His mind seethed with resentment. The Reverend Mother looked at Jessica. You've been training him in the way. I've seen the signs of it. I'd have done the same in your shoes and devil take the rules. Jessica nodded. Now, I caution you, said the old woman, to ignore the regular order of training. His own safety requires the voice. He already has a good start in it, but we both know how much more he needs. And that desperately. She stepped close to Paul, stared down at him. Goodbye, young human, I hope you make it. But if you don't, well, we shall yet succeed. Once more, she looked at Jessica. A flicker sign of understanding passed between them. Then the old woman swept from the room, her robes hissing with not another backward glance. The room and its occupants already were shut from her thoughts. But Jessica had caught one glimpse of the Reverend Mother's face as she turned away. There had been tears on the seamed cheeks. The tears were more unnerving than any other word or sign that had passed between them this day. You have read that Maud Dip had no playmates his own age on Caledon. The dangers were too great, but Maud Dib did have wonderful companion teachers. There was Gurney Halleck, the troubadour warrior. You will sing some of Gurney's songs as you read along in this book. There was Thufir Hawat, an old mentat master of assassins, who struck fear even into the heart of the Padasha emperor. There were Duncan Idaho, the sword master of the Ganaz. 
Dr. Wellington, you a, a name black in treachery, but bright in knowledge. The Lady Jessica, who guided her son in the Bene Gesserit way. And of course, the Duke Leto, whose qualities as a father have long been overlooked. From a child's history of Ma Dib, by the princess, the ruin. Through fear, Hawat slipped into the training room of Castle Caladan, closed the door softly. He stood there a moment, feeling old and tired and storm leathered. His left leg arched where it had been slashed once in the service of the old duke. Three generations of them now, he thought. He stared across the big room, bright with the light of noon pouring through the skylights. Saw the boy seated with back to the door, and tent and papers and charts spread across an L table. How many times much did I tell that lad never to settle himself with his back to a door? Hawat cleared his throat. Paul remained bent over his studies. A cloud shadow passed over the skylights. Again, Hawat cleared his throat. Paul straightened, spoke without turning. I know, I'm sitting with my back to a door. Hawat suppressed a smile, strode across the room. Paul looked up at the grizzled old man who stopped at a corner of the table. Hawat's eyes were two pools of alertness in a dark and deeply seamed face. I heard you coming down the hall, Paul said, and I heard you open the door. The sounds I make could be imitated. I'd know the difference. He might have thought, Hawat thought. That witch mother of his is giving him the deep training, certainly. I wonder what her precious school thinks of that. Maybe that's why they sent the old proctor here. To whip our dear Lady Jessica into line. Hawat pulled up a chair across from Paul, sat down facing the door. He did it pointedly, leaned back and studied the room. It struck him as an odd place suddenly. A stranger place with most of its hardware already gone off to Arrakis. A training table remained, and a fencing mirror with its crystal prisms quiescent. The target dummy, beside it patched and padded, looking like an ancient foot soldier, maimed and battered in the wars. There stand I, Hawat thought. The fur, what are you thinking? Paul asked. Hawat looked at the boy. I was thinking we'll all be out of here soon, likely never see the place again. Does that make you sad? Sad? Nonsense. Parting with friends is a sadness. A place is only a place. He glanced at the charts on the table. And Arrakis is just another place. Did my father send you up to test me? Hawat scowled. The boy had such observing ways about him. He nodded. You're thinking it'd have been nicer if he'd come up himself, but you must know how busy he is. I'll be along later. I've been studying about the storms on Arrakis. The storms? I see. They sound pretty bad. That's too cautious a word. Bad. Those storms build up across six or seven thousand kilometers of flatlands. Feed on anything that can give them a push. Curiolis force. Other storms, anything that has an ounce of energy in it, they can blow up to 700 kilometers an hour, loaded with everything loose that's in their way. Sand, dust, everything. They can eat flesh off bones and etch the bones to slivers. Why don't they have weather control? Arrakis has special problems. Costs are higher, and there'd be maintenance and the like. The guild wants a dreadful high price for satellite control, and your father's house isn't one of the big rich ones, lad. You know that. Have you ever seen the Fremen? The lad's mind is starting all over today, Hawa thought. Like as not, I've seen them, he said. There's a little to tell them from the folk of the Graben and Sink. They all wear those great flowing robes, and they stink to heaven in any closed space. It's from those suits they wear, call them still suits, that reclaim the bodies, own water. 
Paul swallowed, suddenly aware of the moisture in his mouth, remembering a dream of thirst that people could want so for water they had to recycle their body moisture struck him with a feeling of desolation. Water is precious there, he said. Hawat nodded, thinking, perhaps I'm doing it, getting across to him the importance of this planet as an enemy. It's madness to go in there without that caution in our minds. Paul looked up at the skylight, aware that it had begun to rain. He saw the spreading wetness on the gray metal glass. Water, he said. You'll learn a great concern for water, Hawat said. As the Duke's son, you'll never want for it, but you'll see the pressures of thirst all around you. Paul wet his lips with his tongue, thinking back to the day a week ago and the ordeal with the Reverend Mother. She too had said something about water starvation. You'll learn about the funeral plains, she'd said, about the wilderness that is empty, the wasteland where nothing lives except the spice and the sandworms. You'll stain your eye pits to reduce the sun glare. Shelter will mean a hollow out of the wind and hidden from view. You'll ride upon your own two feet, that thopter, a ground car, or mount. And Paul had been caught more by her tone, sing-song and wavering, than by her words. When you live upon Arrakis, she had said, Kala. The land is empty. The moons will be your friend. The sun, your enemy. Paul had sensed his mother come up beside him, away from her post guarding the door. She had looked at the reverend mother and asked, Do you see no hope, your reverence? Not for the father. And the old woman had waved Jessica to silence. She looked down at Paul. Grave this on your memory, lad. A world is supported by four things. She held up four big knuckled fingers. The learning of the wise, the justice of the great, the prayers of the righteous, and the valor of the brave. But all of these are as nothing. She closed her fingers into a fist. Without a ruler who knows the art of ruling, make that the science of your tradition. A week had passed since that day with the Reverend Mother. Her words were only now beginning to come into full register. Now, sitting in the training room with Thufir Hawat, Paul felt a sharp pang of fear. He looked across the Mentat's puzzled frown. Where were you all gathering that time? Hawat asked. Did you meet the Reverend Mother? That truth-sayer witch from the Imperium? Watt's eyes quickened with interest. I met her. She, Paul hesitated, found that he couldn't tell a lot about the ordeal. The inhibitions went deep. Yes. What did she? Paul took two deep breaths. She said a thing. He closed his eyes, calling up the words. And when he spoke, his voice unconsciously took on some of the old woman's tone. You, Paul Atreides, descendant of kings, son of a duke. You must learn to rule. It's something none of your ancestors learned. Paul opened his eyes, said, that made me angry, and I said my father rules an entire planet. And she said, he's losing it. And I said my father was getting a richer planet. And she said, he'll lose that one too. And I wanted to run and warn my father. But she said, he'd already been warned by you, by mother, by many people. True enough, I want muttered. And why are we going, Paul demanded. Because the emperor ordered it. Because there's hope in spite of what that witch spy said. What else spouted from this ancient fountain of wisdom? Paul looked down at his right hand clenched into a fist beneath the table. Slowly, he willed the muscles to relax. She put some kind of hold on me, he thought. How? She asked me to tell her what it is to rule, Paul said. And I said that one commands. And she said I had some unlearning to do. She had a mark there right enough, Watt thought. He nodded for Paul to continue. She said a ruler must persuade. <laughs> she
She said a ruler must learn to persuade and not to compel. She said he must lay the best coffee hearth to attract the finest men. How'd she figure your father attracted men like Duncan and Gurney? Watt asked. Paul shrugged. Then she said a good ruler has to learn his world's language, that it's different for every world, and I thought she meant they didn't speak Galak on Arrakis, but she said that wasn't it at all. She said she meant the language of the rocks and growing things, the language you don't hear just with your ears, and I said that's what Dr. Yoa calls the mystery of life. Watt chuckled. I had that sit with her. I think she got mad. She said the mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. So I quoted the first law of Mentat at her. A process cannot be understood by stopping it. Understanding this flow. process cannot be understood by stopping it. Understanding must move with the flow of the process. You must join it and flow with it. That seemed to satisfy her. He seems to be getting over it, Watt thought. But that old witch frightened him. Why did she do it? The fur, Paul asked. Will Arrakis be as bad as she said? Nothing could be that bad, Watt said and forced a smile. Take those Fremen, for example, the renegade people of the desert. By first approximation analysis, I can tell you there are many, many more of them than the Imperium suspects. People live there, lad. A great many people, and Hua put a sinewy finger beside his eye. They hate Harkonnens with a bloody passion. You must not breathe a word of this, lad. I tell you only as your father's helper. My father has told me of Salusa, Secundus, Paul said. Do you know the fur? It sounds much like Arrakis. Perhaps not quite as bad, but much like it. We do not really know of Salusa Secundus today, Watt said. Only what it was like long ago, mostly. But what is known, you're right on that score. Will the Fremen help us? It's a possibility, Watt stood up. I leave today for Arrakis. Meanwhile, you take care of yourself for an old man who's fond of you, huh? Come around here like the Cathad and sit facing the door. It's not that I think there's any danger in the castle. It's just a habit I want you to form. Paul got to his feet, moved around the table. You're going today. Today it is, and you'll be following tomorrow. Next time we meet, it'll be on the soil of your new world. He gripped Paul's right arm at the bicep. Keep your knife arm free, huh? And your shield at full charge. He released the arm, patted Paul's shoulder, where up, and strode quickly to the door. The fur, Paul called. Hawat turned, standing in the open doorway. Don't sit with your back to any doors, Paul said. A grin spread across the seamed old face. That I won't, lad. Depend on it. And he was gone, shutting the door softly behind. Paul sat down where Hawat had been, straightened the papers. One more day here, he thought. He looked around the room. We're leaving. The idea of departure was suddenly more real to him than it had ever been before. He recalled another thing the old woman had said about a world being the sum of many things. The people, the dirt, the growing things, the moons, the tides, the sun. The unknown sum called nature, the vague summation without any sense of the now. And he wondered, what is the now? The door across from Paul banged open and an ugly lump of a man lurched through it, preceded by a handful of weapons. Well, Gurney Halak, Paul called, are you the new weapons master? Halak kicked the door shut with one heel. Or rather, I came to play games. I know, he said. He glanced around the room, noting that Hawat's men already had been over it, checking, making it safe for a duke's heir. 
The subtle code signs were all around. Paul watched the rolling, ugly man set himself back in motion. Fear tore at the training table with the load of weapons. Saw the nine-string balisette slung over Gurney's shoulder with the multi-pick woven through the strings near the head of the fingerboard. Halleck dropped the weapons on the exercise table, lined them up. The rapiers, the bodkins, the kinjals, the slow pellet stunners, the shield belts, the ink-fine scar along his jawline writhed as he turned, casting a smile across the room. So you don't even have a good morning for me, you young imp, Halleck said. And what barb did you sink in old Hawat? He passed me in the hall like a man running to his enemy's funeral. Paul grinned. Of all his father's men, he liked Gurney Halleck best. Knew the man's moods and deviltry, his humors, and thought of him more as a friend than a hired sword. Halleck swung the balisette off his shoulder, began turning it. If ye won't talk, ye won't, he said. Paul stood, advancing across the room, calling out, Well, Gurney, do we come prepared for music when it's fighting time? So it's sass for our elders today, Halleck said. Tried a chord on the instrument, nodded. We're stuck in Idaho, Paul asked. Isn't he supposed to be teaching me weaponry? Duncan's gone to lead the second wave onto Arrakis, Halleck said. All you have left is poor Gurney, who's fresh out of fight and spoiling for music. He struck another chord, listened to it, smiled, and it was decided in council that you, being such a poor fighter, we'd best teach you the music trade so as you won't waste your life and tire. Maybe you'd better sing me a lay then, Paul said. I want to be sure how not to do it. Aha, Gunny laughed, and he swung into Galatian Girls, his multi-pick a blur over the strings as he sang. Oh, the Galatian Girls will do it for pearls and the Arakian for water, but if you desire dames, like consuming flames, try a Caladian daughter. Not bad for such a poor hand with the pick, Paul said. But if my mother heard you singing a body like that in the castle, she'd have your ears on the outer wall for decoration. Gurney pulled at his left ear. Poor decoration, too. They haven't been bruised so much listening at keyholes, while a young lad I know practiced some strange ditties on his set. So you've forgotten what it's like to find sand in your bed, Paul said. He pulled a shield belt from the table, buckled it fast around his waist. Then, let's fight. Halleck's eyes went wide in mock surprise. So, it was your wicked hand that did the deed. Guard yourself today, young master. Guard yourself. He grabbed up a rapier, laced the air with it. I'm a hell fiend out for revenge. Paul lifted the companion rapier, bent it in his hands, stood in the agua, one foot forward. He let his manner go solemn in a comic imitation of Dr. Yue. What a dolt my father sends me for weaponry, Paul intoned. This doltish gurney Halleck has forgotten the first lesson for a fighting man armed in shield. Paul snapped the force button at his waist, felt the crinkled skin tingle in the defensive sh field at his forehead and down his back, heard external sounds take on characteristic shield-filtered flatness. In shield fighting, one moves fast on defense, Slow on attack, Paul said. Attack has the sole purpose of tricking the opponent into a misstep, setting him up for the attack sinister. The shield turns the fast blow, admits the slow can jowl. Paul snapped up the rapier, fainted fast, and whipped it back for a slow thrust, time to enter a shield's mindless defenses. Halleck watched the action turned at the last minute to let the blunted blade pass his chest. Speed! Excellent, he said. But you are wide open for an underhanded counter with a slip tip. Paul stepped back, chagrined. I should whop your backside for such carelessness, Alex said. He lifted a naked kinjal off the table and held it up. This, in the hand of an enemy, can let out your life's blood. You're an apt pupil, none better. 
but I've warned you that not even in play do you let a man inside your guard with death in his hands. I guess I'm not in the mood for it today, Paul said. Mood? Alex's voice betrayed his outrage, even though the shield's filtering. What has mood to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Mood's a thing for cattle, or making love, or playing the balisette. It's not for fighting. I'm sorry, Gurney. You're not sorry enough. Halak activated his own shield, crouched with Kinjal outthrust in left hand, the rapier poised high in his right. Now I say guard yourself for true. He leaped high to one side, then forward, pressing a furious attack. Paul fell back, parrying. He felt the field crackling as shield edges touched and repelled each other, sensed the electric tingling of the contact along his skin. What's gotten into Gurney, he asked himself. He's not faking this. Paul moved his left hand, dropped his bodkin into his palm for its wrist sheath. You see a need for an extra blade, eh? Halleck grunted. Is this betrayal? Paul wondered. Surely not Gurney. Around the room they fought, thrust and par, faint and counterfaint. The air within their shield bubbles grew stale from the demands on it that the slow interchange along barrier edges could not replenish. With each new shield contact, the smell of ozone grew stronger. Paul continued to back, but now he directed his retreat toward the exercise table. If I can turn him beside the table, I'll show him a trick, Paul thought. One more step, Gurney. Halleck took the step. Paul directed a parry downward, turned, saw Halleck's rapier catch against the table's edge. Paul flung himself aside, thrust high with rapier, and came in across Halleck's neckline with the bodkin. He stopped, the blade an inch from the jugular. Is this what you seek? Paul whispered. Look down, lad, Gurney panted. Paul obeyed, saw Halleck's congel thrust under the table's edge, a tip almost touching Paul's groin. We'd have joined each other in death, Halleck said. Well, uh, I'll admit, you fought some better when pressed to it. You seem to get the mood. And he grinned wolfishly, the ink-fine scar rippling along his jaw. The way you came at me, Paul said. Would you really have drawn my blood? Halleck withdrew the kinjaw, straightened. If you'd fought one whit beneath your abilities, had scratched you a good one. A scar you'd remember. I'll not have my favorite pupil fall to the first Harkonnen tramp who happens along. Paul deactivated his shield, leaned on the table to catch his breath. I deserved that, Gurney, but it would have angered my father if he'd hurt me. I'll not have you punished for my failing. As to that, Alex said, it was my failing too, and you needn't worry about a training scar or two. You're lucky you have a few. As to your father, the Duke to punish me if I only failed to make a first-class fighting man out of you, and I'd have been failing there if I hadn't explained the fallacy in this mood thing you suddenly developed. Paul straightened slipped his bodkin back into its wrist, wrist sheath. It's not exactly play we do here, Halleck said. Paul nodded. He felt a sense of wonder at the uncharacteristic seriousness in Halleck's manner, the sobering intensity. He looked at the bee-colored ink-fine scar on the man's jaw, remembering the story of how it had been put there by Reist Raban in a Harkonnen slave pit on Giddy Prime, and Paul felt a sudden shame that he had doubted Halleck even for an instant. It occurred to Paul then that the making of Halleck's scar had been accompanied by pain, pain as intense perhaps as that inflicted by a reverend mother. He thrust this thought aside. It chilled their world. I guess I did hope for some play today, Paul said. Things are so serious around here lately. Halleck turned away to hide his emotions. Something burned in his eyes. There was pain in him blister. All that was left of some lost yesterday, that time had pruned off him. How soon this child must assume his manhood, Halleck thought. 
how soon he must read that form within his mind, that contracted brutal caution to enter the necessary fact on the necessary line. Please list your next of kin. Halleck spoke without turning. I sense the play in you, lad, and I'd like nothing better than to join in it. But this no longer can be play. Tomorrow we go to Arrakis. Arrakis is real. The Harkonnens are real. Paul touched his forest with forehead with the rapier blade held vertical. Halleck turned, saw the salute, and acknowledged it with a nod. He gestured to the practice dummy. Now we'll work on your timing. Let me see you catch that thing sinister. I'll control it from over here, where I can have a full view of the action. And I warn you, I'll be trying new counters today. There is a warning you'd not get from a real enemy. Paul stretched up on his toes to relieve his muscles. He felt solemn with the sudden realization that his life had become filled with swift changes. He crossed to the dummy, slapped the switch on its chest with his rapier tip, and felt the defensive field forcing his blade away. On guard, Hela called, and the dummy pressed the attack. Paul deactivated his shield, parried, and countered. Halleck watched as he manipulated the controls. His mind seemed to be in two parts, one alert to the needs of the training fight, and the other wandering in fly buzz. I'm the well-trained fruit tree, he thought, full of well-trained feelings and abilities, and all of them grafted onto me, all bearing for someone else to prick. For some reason he recalled his younger sister, her elfin face so clear in his mind, but she was dead now, in a pleasure house for Harkonnen troops. She had loved pansies, or was it daisies? He couldn't remember. It bothered him that he couldn't remember. Paul countered a slow swing of the dummy, brought up his left hand, and transier. That clever little devil, Alec thought intent now on Paul's interweaving hand motions. He's been practicing and studying on his own. That's not Duncan's style, and it's certainly nothing I've taught him. This thought only added to Halleck's sadness. I'm infected by mood, he thought, and he began to wonder about Paul. The boy ever listened fearfully to his pillow throbbing in the night. If wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets, he murmured. It was his mother's expression and he always used it when he felt the blackness of tomorrow on him. Then he thought what an odd expression that was to be taking to a planet that had never known seas or fishes. 